So um, without further ado, Dr. Dr. Finch, would you want to begin your time now with us? Can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. We'll turn the floor over to you. And without interruption, people, family, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Please do not interrupt um, Dr. Finch while he is speaking unless he asks to be interrupted, if he, if he wants interaction. Other than that, please get ready to take notes, listen very intently, and we will hear from our esteemed guest, Dr. Charles Finch. Well, good evening, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, uh, I think we're going to kind of focus on one, you know, you gave me the choice of uh, chapters 14 and or 16. We're going to focus on chapter 16, kind of the works on of Gerald Massey, and we'll get into why focus on Gerald Massey. Um, I am, let me just give me a little bit of background. Uh, I live with my family, my wife, um, in uh, Ellenwood, Georgia, right outside Atlanta. Uh, I have six of our children are still in the area. One is uh, in Virginia. Um, I am retired. <clears throat> I'm a retired physician. Um, what can I say? I have been working, though, in this arena, studying this arena. I started in 1982. Um, seven, uh, I'm sorry, 1971. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, that's age telling on me. So sorry. Uh, 1971, and have continued almost without let up ever since. Um, I have uh, written three books, uh, Echoes of the Old Dark Land, the first one, uh, Star of Deep Beginnings, the second one, and the one that is forthcoming, Nile Valley Civilization, a 10,000 year history. I actually, uh, the first one to publish me, or the first place in which I got published, was in Ivan Van Sertima's journal. Uh, the Journal of African Civilization. And from that day forward, Van Serb and I became very, very close friends. And uh, I um, think I published, I can't remember whether it was six more times. I think it was six more times that uh, I um, uh, published in Van Serb's journal. I'm seeing, by the way, uh, the pre-order for the new book, Civiliz uh, 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 Dial Valley Civilization, a 10,000 year history. Yeah, that's the one that's, uh, it's finished. It just has to be, um, for the first time, we're going to put an index in it. So that has to be done before it sort of comes out. Uh, as I say, I am a physician by training, have been studying, though on my own, um, uh, the civilization of Africa. And a civil, yeah, well, let's just put it like that with a focus on ancient Kemet or Egypt. Kemet, as you know, is the ancient Egyptians name for themselves, meaning literally the black land. And they call themselves Kemiu, right? Which means literally the blacks. Because for a long time, even now, there has been an unwillingness, I should, an unwillingness on the part of the larger society uh, of, uh, of, uh, of people in America and Europe to accept the fact that this was a black African civilization. They just can't bring themselves to do it. Why? Because everything they have in the way of their own civilization comes out of Kemet and therefore comes out of Africa. And I should say, and, and the in Kemet, what we think of as Egypt is not exactly the Egypt that you think of today. It goes down all the way down to Khartoum, back in, I'm sorry, back in, uh, 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 back in antiquity, Kemet, extended as far south as um, Khartoum. Khartoum is where the, uh, the, the White Nile and the Blue Nile come together. So um, that is how far ancient Egyptian or ancient Kemet extended. And um, so, you know, our sense of what ancient Egypt is or was uh, has to be radically revised. And, you know, the thing is, if you've never been to Egypt, if you want to go see who, what the ancient Egyptians would have looked like now, you have to go to the south of Egypt near the Aswan Dam, um, where you see the people that we day call the Nubians. 
those are the the literal the linear descendants of the ancient Egyptians. Okay, uh, and they are the living presence of ancient Egypt, ancient Egypt in what is now Egypt, and that's uh, right near the Aswan, right adjacent practically to the Aswan Dam. And um, what can I tell you? Uh, Egypt is a place, if you can, you should never miss the opportunity to go visit at least once. There's no place like it in the world. But let me not get, uh, that's kind of a digression. Let me not, let me not uh, get off into that right now. Now, uh, I'm just, any more, I'm just trying to think of any more background I can give. Uh, I think that's enough for now because we do want to talk about uh, Gerald Massey. I mean, there are a lot of things we could talk about. But let's just talk about Gerald Massey. Uh, Gerald Massey was born in 1821. Or, uh, 1821. He was uh, the son of a, uh, <laughs> a canal boatman. And so he grew up in very humble circumstances, very humble circumstances. Uh, although he went to school long enough to read and write, he, um, most of his education was self-education, the vast majority. Um, he, uh, he, never, he, never, he never saw a book he didn't like. And he compiled a vast uh, arsenal of knowledge just from his own individual study. And that, he's the one that taught me that uh, all education is true, uh, excuse me, all true education is self-education. All right. Uh, it is. Uh, what can I tell you? That, that's true for him. And even everything, virtually everything I know about ancient Kemet or Egypt, as you know, Kemet is the, as I've already said, Kemet is the ancient Egyptians name for themselves, which, they, which means the black land. Uh, uh, you know, uh, what was I saying? That Kemet is what the ancient Egyptians call themselves and is what we today call Egypt. Now, so, now let's just go back to Matthew. Let's not get too far off the subject. Um, uh, I, I have a tendency to do that. I, I, I get a thought and then I kind of digress. Uh, like I say, he was born in 1821 in England. His father was a boatman. He had a very limited education and had to, you know, work in um, what I want to say, um, a, a low level jobs. He was of the lower class in Egypt. I mean, if you want to say lower class in terms of uh, what his, what the status of his family was, uh, he did go to school long enough to learn how to read and write. But almost from the beginning, his education was self-education. And as I say, he is the one that, shall we say, Im imbued me with the uh, importance of self-education. You will probably never get a more powerful education except how you educate yourself, all right? Because even Ivan Van Sertima, a personal friend of mine, you know, he became Ivan Van Sertima when he came to this country and began studying the presence of Africa in, uh, in pre-colonial America. Um, he actually went down to Mexico and saw those Olmec heads. I think some of you may have may be aware of the Olmec heads. The, I'm going to use this word, so don't, don't, don't take it amiss, but it, it describes. They are the most Negroid looking heads of anywhere in the world. And they're there. Uh, on the Atlantic coast of Mexico. Now, the thing is, people don't realize there were African voyages across the Atlantic 600 years, let's see, six, let's see 800, so, uh, uh, 600 years before Columbus, 700 years before Columbus, uh, or even before the Vikings. Now, these are the only people you ever heard of crossing the Atlantic. Well, that's just another one of those misconceptions and misperceptions about history, particularly the history of people of African descent that have been fostered on the rest of the world. Now, um, Gerald Massey was really an unusual person in a lot of ways. He actually taught himself, he, he, uh, he, he, uh, he did a lot of his own reading and his own studying. And he first made his impact in the world of letters in ancient in, not ancient, in uh, England of the 19th century, he was born in 1821, died in 1820, and died in 1907, um, in poetry. He was a poet, okay? And like I said, most of this was self-education. And, and let me tell you, 
uh, and I would just, I don't know, put that out. You will never edu- you will never be more profoundly educated than the kind of education that you achieve for yourself. First of all, you're not limited by what people think of as education. You're not limited by what people think is true history. All right. You, um, and that, that certainly I never was, and I never could be. Otherwise, I would never have studied Gerald Massey, for example. Gerald Massey has no standing among your uh, academic types. He didn't in the, in the 20, uh, excuse me, in the 19th century, up until his death, um, and he doesn't now. Who, who, who has heard of him? Who talks about him? And yet, uh, his work was profound. He wrote in the course of his life, let me see how long did this go? He started in 1871, died in 1907. It was almost 30 years of un, let me see, unremitting work where he produced uh, three two volume sets, uh, each of them 600 pages. So that's almost 2,000 pages of work. He just worked incessantly. And again, this is out of his own self-education because he got to the place, he was a spirit, oh, I forgot, let me, let, me not, let me mention this. He was a spiritualist, okay? He got very much, he got very interested and fascinated by spiritualism in the 19th century England. And um, he, um, from there, that was how he kind of branched off into Egyptology because it was then, it was in the t- uh, toward the end of the 19th century, last half of the 19th century, through uh, William Flinders Petrie and others, that Egyptology became a, what do you want to call it, um, a discipline, a subject of study, uh, era, or an area of uh, fascination. And uh, one of them was Samuel Burt, one of the 19th century Egyptologists. Samuel Burt actually befriended Massey and kind of guided him along in his studies. Um, now the thing is, and, um, oh yeah. And um, Massey studied, I don't know, obsessively, obsessively in, in, that, in that domain. Um, he was a, and, and this is where, <laughs> this is where he just really uh, uh, upset white people, England in particular. He said with n- no one, so he didn't, he didn't know if, ands, or buts. He said, these people and what we call ancient Egypt were black people. He says that over and over again. He says, the source of European civilization, the civilization of the modern comes from black people. Massey said that. And he had no qualms about saying that. He had no reluctance about saying that. And nobody could shut him up. He didn't care. He got his books published, though. He got his books published. And I say one of them was uh, because he came under the, shall we say, the patronage of of, um, Birch, Samuel Birch, who actually was an established Egyptologist and came to respect and admire Massey. All right. And okay, and now this is and, and this is the uh, crux of the matter for Gerald Massey. That ancient Egypt was a black African civilization, no different from that part of quote black Africa that you know today. All right. Not only that, ancient Egypt was the one who taught the Greeks. Yep taught them. And by the way, if you, if you start reading ancient history, the Greeks didn't deny that, you know. The Greeks never tried to pretend that they were not influenced by ancient Egypt or that a- Egypt did not have any influence, impact on their history. They didn't. And maybe because it was too obvious. But their impact was absolutely profound, ancient Egypt, on the, on the Greeks. And everything that became Greek, Greek, Greek civilization, particularly through, first of all, through Pythagoras. Now, the interesting thing about Pythagoras, 
Pythagoras uh, was the first major uh, Greek philosopher. But he was, he was half Phoenician. Yeah his, mother, yeah, his mother was Phoenician. You say, so what? You got to understand, the Phoenicians themselves were related to the ancient Egyptians. And they were linked to the ancient Egyptians. So you don't, can't think of Phoenicia, ancient Phoenicia without uh, thinking about their connection to uh, ancient Egypt. And Pythagoras was half Phoenician. And he is the one who really be, he is the one who launched Greek philosophy. You might even say Greek science. That was Pythagoras. And, and that came out of Egypt and he said so. Um, and, and like I said, those early Greek philosophers and scholars, they had no qualms about um, asserting the primacy of ancient Egypt and what they thought of as civilization. So wherever you may be in the Western world, Europe, America, a good, uh, 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 even places which don't even acknowledge ancient Egypt, like the Arab world. It all comes from there. Going back uh, to 6,000 years ago, 4,000 BC. Now remember, now you're going to see, you're going to see uh, uh, articles about ancient Egypt, and they'll talk about ancient Egypt. The, the dynastic period begins 3100 BC. So much lies and misinformation. No, no. The dynastic period begins about 4200 BC. And that doesn't mean that that's when ancient Egypt started. Kemet. That's what they, by the way, that's what they call themselves. Kemet, which is the word that meant the black land. And now we now have ev evidence that has emerged over the last two to three years that you can really trace ancient Egypt back to 10,000 BC. Well, how do you know that? It's sitting right there in front of your very eyes, the Sphinx. The Sphinx. You know, <laughs> if you go to Egypt now, or even you see in pictures, you see that the Sphinx has half of its nose blown off. Who did that? Napoleon. Why? Because it was too Negroid to suit him. Yes, half is known. And that, um, uh, that nose still exists. It's supposed to be in the Louvre in Paris. They haven't ever given it back. No. And anyway, the Sphinx, 10, why do we say the Sphinx goes back to 10,000 BC? This is recent work by uh, uh, several you know, later scholars named Boval and I'll think of the last, I'll, th I'll think of the other man. They were they were kind of partners in this. Okay, um, <laughs> because if you look at this, if you go to the Sphinx, if you, any of you have been, who 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 have ever been to Kemet or plan to go to Kemet, when you go and look, yeah, there it is, lovely, great. On the you you see surrounding the Sphinx. There is a, uh, um, uh, I don't want to call it a ditch, but you can see the, the wall. Great. That's a very good example of it. And that actually goes down to the, uh, where the Sphinx is sitting. And like I said, you can, you can, it's a very good picture of that uh, nose that was blown off. And by the way, the Sphinx is older than the pyramids. Because, it's, you know, the why, why do we know? any and all of that. Because if you look at those, um, you look at the walls, the clay walls, they have, what do you want to say? They are, um, uh, the, the, they're layers, shall we say. There are layers of clay, different colors of clay that are, represent different time frames of existence. 
So you just, just look at them. Look at it. So when you go from the top to the bottom, those are deeper and therefore older levels of clay. So if you look at where the Sphinx, how the Sphinx is resting, it is resting at a level, at the lowest level of clay. Mm. Mm. What about the climate? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> My wife is trying to get me to remember, remind me of something. Um, those, you see those, those, those levels of clay, those levels surrounding the Sphinx. Those are, um, you might say, time periods. That's the reason why someone reminded me there's also shock, S-C-H-O-C-H, -C -H, as, as another one of the more recent investigators. You can't, oh, and none of these men are Egyptologists. Because these Egyptologists are, are simply not going to be able to tolerate them. But they, you know, they are, you know, they are men who, who, who have seen what they have seen and they tell it literally like it is. Anyway, those, um, what you're looking at, they, at the bottom, at the bottom of those, of that, what do you want to call it? I'm trying to, I can't even think of the name of, of the, uh, around the Sphinx. Those, those bottom layers. Those are 10,000 years. That's 10,000 years right there. BC, 12,000 years uh, before now. And that look at where and look at where the uh, Sphinx sits. It sits at a place that is um, gosh, why am I having so much trouble saying the obvious? It's, it's sitting at a place where it is it, it is at the same level as those bottom layers. So that's how you know that the Sphinx is as old has to be traced back to them. So that makes it not uh, 4,000 BC, 3,000 BC or 4,000 BC. It goes back to 10,000 BC. Sphinx is older than the pyramids. It's older than the pyramids. So look at the Sphinx. Look at that. Look at the statue. It's a statue. A huge, a massive statue. Perfectly realized. 10,000 BC. So that means there was a, civ a civilization in place capable of carving and erecting a statue like that. Oh, that's a good picture. You see the, uh, uh, the second pyramid. I can't, I can't think of, uh, it, you know, I'm talking so fast that I can't, I can't keep the names in my head. But that's a great picture because the Sphinx sits in front of that. And it's a, also, it's a great, I won't say it's a great picture, but you can see where the nose was blown off. And that was done by Napoleon, Napoleon's army. So angry at when they saw the Sphinx, at what the fact that this was, a, and I got to use this word, sorry, that this was a Negro, that they just lost it. Napoleon just lost it. And blew the blew the nose off as if by uh, mutilating the the sphinx. He is trying to um, remove its origins from history. Okay, and as I say, the sphinx is actually older than you can see the pyramids in the background, right like that. Now, the pyramids there are ninety apparently ninety seven pyramids in ancient Egypt, but the ones that we know about are the three pyramids of Giza on the plateau of Giza, about, oh, 10 or 15 miles west of Cairo. And, uh, of course, the most important one, or the major one, yeah, is uh, the, uh, the first one is the one you can see under the Step Pyramid of Djoser. He was a uh, pharaoh of the Third Dynasty. Third Dynasty. Um, and um, Step Pyramid and, and uh, Imhotep, who's actually more famous than his pharaoh, was a designer of that step pyramid 
that you see there. Okay. Um, it's still sitting there. You can still see it. And there's seven levels. And that was the first, uh, the, 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 the world's first pyramid or pyramid like structure. Then as you can go down where it says the three great periods at Giza down below, down below Khufu or Ke Cheops. And <clears throat> there are three of them. The largest one, although it's in the back, it's, it's behind. So it seems like it's the smaller one, but it's the, it's, the, it's the most, it's the biggest and the most important one. It rises to a height of 483 feet. Um, oriented exactly to uh, north, south, east, and west. Uh, the difference is, is, is I, I, have been, I have been there several times, and every time I go, I make a point of walking around it, circumambulating it. And um, you, can actually, you, you can actually go in there, by the way. They have opened it up so you can actually go inside that pyramid. Um, um, the Great Pyramid. And it's oriented to north, south, east, and west, uh, rises to a height of 483 feet. The sides of the pyramid, four sides, they, as huge as it is, the margin of error for those sides is like seven feet. So, so it's the precision that has uh, astounded people since then. How could you have something? Because, see, how many blocks of stone there are something like two million blocks of stone I, i'm sorry i don't have the exact number two million blocks of stone the smallest one is two tons the largest one is 16 tons uh, it hasn't nothing like that's been done since nothing there, there's there's just nothing they could they, look at it they got three of them and the smaller ones but they in totally have 97 pyramids You can't say that the ancient Egyptians invented the pyramid form, but they certainly, I don't know what you want to say. They're the ones that put it on the consciousness of the world. And, um, oh, one other thing about, about the Great Pyramid. If you go, if you're there at night, you will see the hmm, star Sirius. You see, they have a uh, they, they, the opening. The entrance to the pyramid points due north, and at a certain time, the star Sirius, uh, um, the star Sirius, passes across the uh, the opening, and you can, and you can actually see it, and it actually flat. Oh, and thing. <laughs> It, it actually projects light down through that open passage and it goes all the way down to the base of the pyramid without ever deviating from straightness to the bottom, to the base of the pyramid. I mean, it, um, I've already talked about Gerald Massey. Ellen, okay. Um, I'm, I'm just, uh, I know this is not supposed to be specifically a, a discussion of the Great Pyramid, but we're, we, you know, we're covering, we're just cover, covering all this ground. And, you know, I don't have to tell you, those of you who are, have tuned in, the, how fabulous all this is. Now, I want you to look, they show you the Kush Nubian archers. And who are those people? Who are they? Do I have to say, talk about who they are? And you, and they just, they have gone to, ex even now, extraordinary lengths to de-Africanize Egypt. Can't happen. It can't happen. Won't happen, no matter how much they try. And like I said, <clears throat> The ancient uh, Greeks, the, the ancient, this is, you can't blame the, the, the Greeks for this because the Greeks had nothing but 
not merely respect, but um, talking so much, I can't even come up with the, the proper adjective. They revered Egypt and the Egyptians, at least all the way down through the time of Christ. Now, um, ancient Egypt, um, oh, uh, anyway, okay, let's, let's, you know, let's keep going. Now, what we think of as our, mm -hmm, our religion, our philosophy, came right out of there. The name uh, through, mostly through mm -hmm, the religion of uh, Isis and Osiris, or Asar and Aset. Now, Aset means throne or seat. Osiris is Asar means born of Isis because in his earliest manifestation, he was actually a son of Isis, even before Horus, Osiris was. Osiris, as you know, or some of you know, he was killed by his brother Set, who cut up his body into 14 pieces. But it was Isis who collected all the parts of his body and reconstituted him and resurrected him. With one exception, the phallus. <laughs> the phallus was just gone. Oh, no, I think it had been swallowed by a fish. What did Isis do? She fashioned a new phallus for Osiris, who was both her brother and her husband. And when she did that, she was able to get herself pregnant with Horus or Heru, whose name means the face of heaven. But there's so much. <laughs> uh, what do you say? What can you say to that? And um, so <laughs> um, Isis, the, the religion of Isis or Aset is the one religion in Egypt that survives the demise of Egypt itself. Because the worship of Isis, um, the worship of Isis, and you can see there uh, someone is, is showing you, trying to point out Abydos, Philae, and Edfu. Abydos is the sacred to uh, Osiris. Philae is uh, sacred to, who is it? I think it's, I think, just, I think it's, uh, yeah, Isis, and Edfu is a sacred to Horus. Okay. Yes, sir. That's me, uh, Enoch Hankerson, um, um, Dr. Charles Franks, who's uh, pointing this out for you. Well, that's fine. Keep doing it. It's good. So people know, can get a sense of what I'm talking about and who I'm talking about, when I'm talking about them. Now, um, trying to go, keep going without, you know, uh, getting off track here a little bit. Because what we think of as Judeo-Christianity comes from Egypt or Kemet. That isn't even arguable. The people we call the Hebrews, by their own history, by their own reckoning, spent 400 years in Egypt. You can't spend 400 years in a country and not be influenced by it. Now, um, there, was, there was a point I was getting ready to, okay, let's go to Christianity. Because Christian, the, the name Christ derives from the Egyptian word karast, K-A-R-A-S-T. And, and karast was a mummified form of Osiris. So it was a form of Osiris in the process of resurrection. And in, the, and, in, and Christianity, it becomes what? Christ. The first, and then of course, I'm sorry, then there's Osiris, who was Karast. There's Isis, or Aset. And she was the uh, uh, sister wife of Osiris and the, and the mother of Horus. 
and she was so sacred, is that the Romans brought her to Rome to worship. You know, in Roman times, that was the only God from Egypt, deity from Egypt, that they brought out of Egypt and brought to Rome was Isis. And, I, and in fact, uh, they got uh, the, 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 look, not the pharaohs, the, mm -hmm. the rulers of Rome started getting upset because every, uh, the Egyptians, excuse me, the Romans were all flocking to uh, worship Isis. Or I said, oh, and Isis, the worship of Isis went beyond Rome and into Europe. Even now you can find the temples of Isis in Europe. And what does Isis, Isis look like? Black. Yes. The Romans and the early Europeans always represented Isis or Aset as the black goddess. And she was the supreme goddess. And her worship went all, went all over, went as far west as Spain. Rome, Spain. And as I say, she's a prototype of Mary. Now Mary, the name word Mary, name Mary comes from Mare, in Egyptian word Mare, which means beloved or loved. And there were, uh, let me make sure I get this right now. Oh boy, that's mare. Okay, let, let's not. I'm trying to trying to do too much at once. So her name was Mare. That was Isis's name now, and she became the supreme goddess of Rome. In fact, the Roman um, priests of the Roman religion uh, didn't like her try to do something about it because people were all gravitating towards her from Egypt, who were, you know, Isis being, Isis being from Egypt. And uh, what else? Osir we've already said Osiris. Horus was Heru, which means the face. The face, the face of heaven. All right, and as I said, he is the son of uh, Osiris and, I mm, and Isis, or Asar and Aset, Heru. And Heru means the face means the face of heaven, and he was the one who had to or did battle Set. Set has a didn't start out in e in Egyptian religion with the bad reputation that he developed later on, because he is the one who was accused of killing Osiris. And so, what? but I told you about what Isis did, right? She, I, and he cut her up into, he, he cut her, not her, set cut Osiris up into 14 pieces. And Isis found 13 of them, and then had to fashion the 14th, which was a phallus, reconstituted Osiris, resurrected him, and impregnated herself with him. Uh, and that is how Horus was born. But she had to get, she had to take Horus away because Set was looking for him to, to, to kill him. And she took him into the papyrus swamp where she raised Horus. Okay. Until Horus was ready to come out and challenge Set. Um, and by the way, Set's name is a prototype of the later Judeo-Christian Satan. Because Satan, if you, if you break down the uh, etymology of the word, Satan is set on. Set on, which means the second set. On is the second, or the re-manifestation. Satan is the uh, set on the remanifestation of Set. Horus and Set, when Horus came out, when he was old enough to take the battle to Set, came out of the swamps and they had a titanic battle. They, they, it was a titanic battle. And finally, Horus was just about to conquer Set. 
and destroy him. Ah, Thoth or Jehudi stepped in and said no. Thoth is the, the ancient Egyptian god of mind, will, and intelligence. He is the mind and will and intelligence of the entire universe of all existence. He said, no, it is not for set to be destroyed permanently. So he stepped in and uh, insisted on the peace between them. And um, so, and that's Jehudi or Thoth. The Greeks called him Hermes. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> I even think that the word thought comes from his, the Greek form of his name, Thoth. Now, I've been talking a long time, and I'm not sure what, where I should go from here. Um, um, anybody want to suggest something? <laughs> well, well, thank you very much, um, um, Dr. Finch. This is... Um, Sister Annie, the um, you know the instructor here. I want to um, thank you for that. I also want to let everyone know that our Caress Unity Ministerial Council is here as well. We have um, Sister um, Abut Simpson, who is in West Africa at this time. Um, it's three o'clock in the morning there, and she's here to greet you, as well as the class. And we certainly appreciate her for that. And we have um, Reverend Erica Nemot Bird. Um, who is our um, minister as well, and she's right near you at this time. She's in the state of Florida, and she's here. So if they would like to unmute and address the um, class and as well as speak to you, um, our ministers, please go ahead and do so. I'm trying to see everyone. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, I I just want to say a big, 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 uh, warm greeting and and do I owe to you, uh, Dr. Finch, for your scholarship for your coming and joining us and teaching us in this class. We really appreciate all that you have given to us. I know it's gonna in um, um, enrich and inspire our class even more to continue the studies. Um, I just, you know, we're always learning and I appreciate having the opportunity to um, study and learn from you. Uh, I know Simsit has more to say and I just want to thank the class and, and the leadership in the class and the teachers and for all the work that you do. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you so much and blessings. Okay, let, let me say this, because it's just something. <clears throat> I, I think you're already doing this, and others are, although there's not enough. You, you, you've got to, shall we say, lead people of African descent in the Americas, wherever you are, back to their ancient history. They can't go forward without it. Uh huh. They have to have it. We, I don't say they, we. You have to start there and recreate from there. I say. Because that's the one thing. That's one thing about people of the Nile Valley and Ethiopia. That oh, they kept that history going. They that, that was serious business with them. And so I would just I don't know what to say. I, I just want to impress upon you the 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 the, the need to keep doing that uh, two or three hundred more years. Don't think you're going to get this done in your lifetime. Don't even try. Don't even try to get it done in your lifetime. But mm. you're going to have, those of you are going to have grandchildren, great-grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera. Then you, imb you imbue them with knowledge like this and now imbue them with knowledge and say, look, it is your responsibility to carry it forward. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Dr. Dr. Fence, let me ask, what do you think um, can be done? I, you know, I know that, you know, we've we've learned that a lot of what they're doing to our statues and monuments are uh, they're defacing them, but and and much of that is attributed to the political structure. Is there anything else we can do to assist in our preserving okay. our our legacy the, and our monuments there? 
okay, uh, I understand the concern, and it's a real concern, but you got to understand, most of what is ancient Egypt, was ancient Egypt, is still beneath the sands. Most of those artifacts and remains and architectural uh, monuments, etc., most of it is still buried beneath the sands. They have not, by any means, uh, excavated all of ancient Egypt. It's there waiting. And you know what? The people of ancient Kemet knew this was going to happen. You know? They knew what was going to happen to Kemet eventually. And this is the reason why they, they etched all of this, you know, all of these writings, all of these teachings in stone on the walls of the temples. That's why they, that's why they, uh, what do you want to say? They uh, uh, created things in stone to outlast all of the attempts to destroy ancient Egypt. Nope. Can't do it. First of all, how are you going to destroy the pyramids? What are you going to do? Bomb them into, uh, bomb them into oblivion? Is that what you're going to do? Or try to? <laughs> no. But it doesn't matter. Because most of what is in ancient Egypt is still beneath the sands. Wow. Mm. Hasn't even yeah, been yeah, exploded yeah. yet. Yeah. And not only right there on both either side of the Nile, but going way out into the desert, especially the Western desert. Shoot, are you kidding me? Africa doesn't even know. Uh, let me not get started. Africa doesn't even know itself. I've been to Africa too much, spent too much time there. I know. Yeah, I know. All right. I mean, at least I know that much. And, you know, and, but I also, I guess I'm old enough to realize, I said, okay, dude, talking to myself, you're not going to get, you know, you're, you're not going to sort this out in your lifetime or your grandchildren's lifetime. You're not going to get it even all sorted out in this, and you, it's not going to get all sorted out even in this century, but it will get sorted out. You see, that's the thing about those netters. I saw, was, okay, let's use Osiris, Isis, Horus, Thoth, Moot. Et cetera, et cetera. They haven't gone anywhere. They didn't stop existing, you know. You, you, you I see up on the left, you can see there's, you got ha oh, Hathor. How could I forget Hathor? Jeez. Hathor and Konshu and uh, Sebek. Um, uh, Knum, Knum. They're still there. They haven't gone anywhere. What what makes you th what makes anyone think they 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 have just because you think they're a figment of someone's imagination? Mm -mm. They're there. You see, <laughs> they got a lot more time than we got. They are eternal. They can wait. They're going to wait people out, human beings out, for all the all the th things that they have done against ancient Egypt and against them. So in that, in that sense, I don't. I just can't worry, but it's too much because, as I say, there's nothing that I personally can do about that. But at the same time, I know that they're not going to be able to uh, destroy, destroy it. They're not, and the netters are still there. The netters, what we call the gods, they are still there, and they're not going to allow it. Mm -mm. We've gone through a, we've had a bad time in our collective history, what, two or 3,000 years, two, 20, but uh, uh, all these things come to an end. Okay, I say, um, Reverend Erica, was that your primary uh, question or did you have something else to say? That's fine, thank you. No, I don't. I'm going to just uh, yield the time to the next person, I'm sure. There are other questions and comments. Thank you so much, Doctor. And thank you, uh, Annie. Appreciate you. Ashe, all right. So very good. So we we're going to circle back to our other um, our minister, is a but Simpson. We're going to circle back to her, and we have a question in the chat from um, Reverend Amadi Hines. 
Uh, Reverend Amadi, did you want to read your own question or did you want me to read it for you? Um, I I'll read it, no problem. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, uh, Dr. Finch, uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to uh, hear you tonight. And um, yeah, there's a question I've always wondered about, you know, in my teaching in terms of creation. So I'll read the question for you, okay? Uh, well, you know, you teach a lot about feminine energy and, you know, and, 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 and so I'd like to hear your thoughts about an idea uh, you know, since everything is born of woman, I, I equate the Agduad and the primordial waters as being primarily feminine energies. And so we know in the creation story, Ra emerges, a tomb out of the waters of Noon, as well as the Agduad. And so since these energies, you know, symbolically like water, mystery, eternity, and darkness, well, those are all kind of feminine symbols. And so I was wondering, can the, can the Agduad and the waters of noon be equated with what, you know, some might call the cosmic womb, you know, and even though we know that those energies are male and female, you know, I would say, and the way I teach it is, you know, the accent is on the feminine. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that in terms of, you know, the male energy of, of, of Ra emerging out of the feminine energy of the waters of noon. Absolutely. I wish, I'm glad you remind, you brought that up. Everything that comes out of ancient Egypt comes out of the mother, the divine mother. And they knew it and they said it. Um, uh, you know, you, you kind of said it in a way that I don't have a whole lot more to add to it, except to say just what you're saying, that the, if the feminine you is it is was and well it has always been a feminine universe and you know what <laughs> you know who was first among human beings the female there was a time when human beings were anything but female hmm. and maleness masculinity came out of them why Diversity, the, 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 the diversity created by the union of male and female, let's say female and male, is what um, allowed for, for the evolution of the human race. But the female was first. The mother was first. And, uh, and out of her, her son, S-O-N, you know, and, you know, especially through all these religions, it's always the son who comes from the mother. Now, it's not to diminish the fatherhood by any stretch of the imagination, as you said, Bra, Osiris, but it's the, it's the feminine and the motherhood that is primary. I'm glad you brought that up because I... And so the, so the thing is... Yeah. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I meant to say something about it, but it got to talking, so I didn't... It, I, I forgot to, but anyway. But I'm glad you did bring that... I'm glad you brought it up. That's all I can say. Well the, well, the last point on that, though, when I see it depicted, a lot of times when I see Noon, Nunat, and the um, the Agduad, I see them sort of like as a you know a man with a beard, <laughs> and so you know, so when I see them like you know depicted, it's sort of like as a masculine. But I've always felt intuitively that it's a feminine. That so uh, that that's the reason why I wanted to kind of get that cleared up with the with the uh, scholar as yourself. Well, I don't know. You, you've said it. I don't know. Uh, what, yeah, I don't know if I have anything to add to it. Oh, well, that's fine. Thank you. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on it. I appreciate that. Thank you. I say. All right. Um, so, is there any? If okay, we're circling back. This is Sister Any, your instructor here. Um, so, I don't see. Are there any? Is um, any of the ministers here? If not, uh, we'll go back to the chat. Um, all right. Um, I believe, Diamond, did you have a question for Dr. Uh, I do. I do. And this is one I've been dying to ask you, Dr. Finch, for quite some time. Um, and uh, this is uh, just come out of, um, and, and, and unfortunately, it, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with uh, today's subject, but 
Uh, so forgive me if I'm out of order, but um, you know, this this has a lot to do with uh, I guess what would one would call the out of Africa theory. Um, and I heard that uh, you were you were you were somebody that everyone was telling me I need to talk to. And this is uh, has something to do with uh, the ice age and the migration uh, that somehow... not a theory. Wait, but let me stop you right there. Not a theory. Okay, it's a I was hard, giving... irrefutable fact. Okay, so th know. this is this is something that I needed more, you know, just more evidence. Can you direct me to some resources to get? Because I, I still got questions, and what I'm hearing so far doesn't satisfy all the questions. Yeah. And so, uh, so is there is there a a, um, a resource you can direct me to in order <laughs> well, to? I don't know. I, me, I don't know. know. I'm just. I was thinking, and I can only give you. I can only come up with one. Okay. Uh, my book. All right. I, I I devote several chapters. Ellen, which book is it that? The, yeah, my book. Let me see. Let's see if I can find it. A am I on? I mean, can people see? Can people see me? The yeah, audience? Dr. Finch. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, this is my this is my first book. Echoes of the Old Dark Land, themes from the okay. African. And that, um, okay. we talk about that in the for opening chapters of this book. Okay. All right. And um, now, now, what would uh, remind me? Redefine that question that you asked for me. And make sure I'm not forget. I'm, I'm remembering. Well, I, I wanted to know, uh, you know, it's just I had several questions about uh, about that. It, I have it's just some unanswered questions, and they were just telling me you were the you were the source to go to in order. And, to and, what, and what was the unanswered question? <laughs> it's several of them. Well, um, just, just, just give me the the <laughs> give me the pertinent one, the the one the, the one that's most you know pertinent in your mind, the most uppermost in your mind well what, I, what i'm looking for is is that irrefutable evidence that 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 africans turn to white people yeah oh yeah that's okay, right so, that, so that's, that's what I, i'm book. looking for that that's I'm my book that. because you see you gotta understand human beings first emerge on this planet through an evolutionary process uh, somewhere between 200,000 and 300,000 years ago, in Africa, totally and completely. They didn't leave Africa until 100,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. They didn't start changing into other races until about 50,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, why, how, but even so, they didn't become Caucasians until about 12, starting about 12,000 years ago. Why? What happened 12,000 years ago? The Ice Age. Mm -hmm. The okay. Ice Age, which was diminished, you know, the sunlight on the sun uh, impact or its uh, impact on the earth. And what happened, the, the uh, the people who became the Caucasians had to stay in the northern realms. Well, mm. or no, not only they had to, but they did. And by doing that, in order to survive, they had to lo lose their pigment. They had to lose melanin. Because, no. they, because, you see, what does the sunlight do? The sunlight... Uh, uh, produces vitamin D in the skin necessary for the mineral, proper mineralization of the bones. And only Caucasians, well, by losing their pigment, they could absorb more of the diminished sunlight. Why was the sunlight diminished? Because this was the Ice Age, okay? So most of the people had moved out of the northern realms and into Africa and other, back into Africa and other places. Those who stayed, and if they survived, they had to lose their pigment. And that's how they became white. Because by becoming white, losing their pigment, they could absorb more of the uh, rays of the sun that would uh, 
produce vitamin D. That's a, if you don't have vitamin D, the bones will not mineralize properly. Okay. You won't survive as a, you know, as a group, as a race. So is, is that the process that generated the Neanderthal gene? Not sure. Okay. I don't know enough about the Neanderthals, quite honestly. I, I'm not, I don't know that I can answer that. You know, Neanderthals are one of the um, arenas that I don't really have a, a, a good handle on. So I don't think okay. I can answer that question. Okay, I look forward to reading your book. Thank you so much for, for this. This right. is a dream You're come welcome. true for me. Thank you. Appreciate you, um, Baba Diamond. And, and thank you again, Duau, to Dr. Fitch. We have another question um, from the chat. And this is one of our um, Reverend Elders here at Koresh Unity Center of African Spiritual Science. Sister Tamu, did you want to ask your question or did you want me to read it from the chat? Reading it from the chat is fine, thank you. Oh, okay. And what is her name? Uh, the, the one that just said had something to say, what was her name? Her name is Tamu. Oh, Tamu. You yes. know, I, I thought I heard you say Tamil. <laughs> <laughs> and, the re and I reason why I, I asked the reason why I perked up. I said, well, you know, the Tamil are the black people of India. So that's the All reason right. why, that that's why when I thought I heard Tamil, that's the reason why I said, oh, you know, but okay. So that's the reason why I was asking that I was uh, seeking clarification on your name, ma'am. I, I hope that was okay. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay, go, okay. Will, will, will you, okay, go ahead and ask question, Sure. Her question is, Dr. Finch, why do you think we Africans have gone through so much during the Piscean age? <laughs> Hmm. I'm just trying to think if it is the Piscean age. You realize, and this is a point that you, you know you're not going to like to hear. We set ourselves up, you know. We set ourselves up for what happened to us. It wasn't, you know, um, because I'm going to look you in the eye. Who helped? the European enslaved Africans. Other Africans. Other Africans, yes. I'm, I'm sorry. That's a, that's, a, that's a harsh reality. But they assist in fact, and this is where it gets, it gets really bad. Those, those African, West African chiefs and kings wanted to keep the slave trade going even after the European wanted to shut it down. And it didn't really uh, shut down until the Europeans had conquered all of Africa by 1898. Sorry. We got to be able to, you know, we always like to hear about all the great things we did and all the, you know, the pyramids and our great this and the great that. But you need to look at that side of it, too. We helped, the, we, we uh, you know, we helped them enslave, our, enslave us. That's the truth. You need to you need to I come say, you need to come to terms with that. I say um, I just wanted to just interject that we are a center of truth here, Doctor French, and yes. we, we are not offended by the truth. We are not afraid of the truth, and we live by the truth here at Cross Unity Center of African Spiritual Science. So anything of truth, we embrace, we investigate, and we try to use it as a lesson. That's so essential. what you're saying is not offending us at all. Not, okay, not that's even. essential. If you if you want to be you, we want to move into the future with any hope of recovering ourselves. Let's put it like that. That's not. I'm not being very uh, well. Yeah, yeah. Just recovering what we had. You got you, the truth, and the truth. Uh, you know, what's that, what's that old saying, know the truth and the truth will set you free? The truth hurts, can hurt too, you know, hurts a lot. But we have to look at it and we have to accept it uncompromisingly. Let me just add, what would Africans gain by in, uh, doing that to other Africans? Uh, there was a lot, even now, there's a lot of... Uh, Interethnic uh, strife. You know, we don't. We can't understand it. We think all Africans are Africans. No, they they don't look at it that way. 
They don't. They, Pan Africanism didn't begin in Africa. It's not even in Africa today. Except, you know, Lumumba. You could think about not Lumumba, uh, Nkrumah, and you could look at a few others. Shake on to Joke, who I knew personally. But uh, African ethnic groups are at each other still. Uh, have a shall we say? There's still an enmity there among them. They haven't overcome that. We don't like to think that that's true, but it is true. Heck, we have done more in the Western Hemisphere to overcome those kind of differences than has yet even ever even yet happened to Africa, in Africa. Now, I, I don't want to overstretch. I don't want to overstate that because I think in certain places, you know, in Krumah's example of the, of someone who was trying to move Africa out of that way of thinking. You know, and he's a member, he welcomed Malcolm, he welcomed Du Bois, you know, but he was very unusual. And there, then I, I know of others, as I say, Shekanta Joke from Senegal, but they haven't, as, as a whole, there has not been, there's still this, uh, ethnic, uh, you know, ethnocentrism. That's that's the best word that happens in Africa. And you know, that's why I, I'm just telling you again. You got you. We. That's a good picture of Joe, by the way. That's perfect for him. He was a physicist, physicist and a historian and a linguist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He was a he was a, he was a multi talented genius. Um. Um. Now I forgot what I was trying to say. Oh, oh yeah. Um. Pan-Africanism did not begin in Africa. And even now, it hasn't really taken root in Africa. To the extent that there is any Pan-Africanism is here. And we can't say that it's widespread even here, but it's more of it here than it is anywhere else. Maybe you could go, you know, you go into the Caribbean as well, you know, Jamaica, Garvey, etc. Yeah, do that. But to the extent that there is Pan-Africanism, it's on this side of the Atlantic, mostly. I'm not going to say it's entirely absent. You know, shake on to Jope and say, uh, not sh it's not Diop, by the way. People want to say Diop. It's not Diop, it's Jope. That's, his, that's how you pronounce his last name, D-I-O-P, Jope. And um, so, you, you you know, it's not that they, it's not like they don't exist there. But, and Jope, you know, <laughs> boy. <laughs> Job was uncompromising, politically uncompromising, as well as a near genius or a near genius intellectually and historically. And uh, Senghor threw him into jail four times. Four times. He almost died in jail. I know this because I, I knew the man. And he would tell these stories. And he only, he, he, he only got to age 62 before he died. I'm 75. I've outlived him myself. So, you know, we, we got to look at, you know, both sides of it in Africa. We can't just look at all the great things that we've done. Some of it, too much, too much of it has not been so great. Okay, we appreciate that. We have another question, um, Dr. Finch, from the chat, and it's, I believe it's from Reverend Erica. Uh, is it Erica? No, excuse me. Yes, we have one from Reverend Erica. Um, did you want me to read that, Reverend Erica, or were you going to ask it? Yes, go it. ahead. You can read it, please. Okay, all right. This is a question from one of our ministers, our senior ministers. Um, are you familiar with the evactions, excuse me, excavations? Are you familiar with the excavations and discoveries in Napta Playa? There is evidence that what we call Egyptian civilization moved down the Nile to Egypt and not the other way around. Moved down the Nile from where? Oh, no, say that again. The evidence okay. is, in what direction are you talking about? From north to south or south to north? 
from south to north. Of course, mm -hmm. of course, of course. That is you can argue. The, the Nile moves the, down moves. towards Egypt. Yeah, yeah, it, it moves north, but that is for you know the ancient Egyptian ancient Egyptians up, say, north. Uh, uh, up south and down north. Up south, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, um, I'm trying to think. What was the point that I was making? Um, yeah, so the river, I, you know, uh, the, the, I remember one time, the last time I was there, I couldn't sleep. And I was on the island of Elephantine in Upper Egypt. And uh, so I went outside onto the veranda, or well, not the veranda, you know, the outside. Of, and I, was, and I, I could see the Nile flowing north. You say, so what? But you see, when, you, when it was like that, there was, no, there, was no, there were no distractions. It was the nighttime, so everything was sleeping. And I said to myself, I could feel the power of the Nile. Now, you know, you're going to look at you, you're you crazy, dude, you know. I could feel the power of the Nile. I said, oh. So, the, you know, because the, the, the people of ancient Kemet considered the Nile a deity. And I finally had a, I had a sense of that just by watching it flow, flow north. I had never, I just, I don't know what to say. I, I had been to Egypt by that time. I forgot how many times, 11 times, maybe more. But I'd never seen the Nile in that way before or felt it. That's, that's the thing. It's more, it's, it was as much a feeling as it was a visual experience. And I said, oh, so this is why the Nile became sacred and divine in ancient Kemet. I've never forgotten that. And, you know, not just Kemet either now. We, not just Kemet at all. We haven't even mentioned, we haven't even talked about Ethiopia. And maybe that's another, that's for another time. But, you know, not just Kemet. Um, and, then, you know, that, that river from uh, Tanzania, the Great Lakes of Tanzania, around there, all the way up to Cairo, that's a 4,000, that's a four, that's 4,000 miles that river flows. 4,000 miles. And the ancient, four of the ancient Egyptian pharaohs sent um, expeditions down to the source of the Nile. And they brought back people, the Twa, one, one or two representatives of the Twa, known more commonly, although uh, incorrectly, as the so called pygmies. Because you see, uh, one of the major deities of ancient Egypt was represented as a so-called pygmy or twa. That was a pita, in fact. And so when he got that, when they when they got that so-called that uh, that twa to ancient Egypt, he was lionized. He they just what can I say? They just treated him like royalty. Very good. All right, um, Dr. Finch, um, once again, this is um, Sister Annie, um, the class um, instructor. And we have a question from the chat from Ama. Yes, she's a, friend, she's a personal friend of mine. So, yes, I would like to get her question. Okay. All right. This, okay, uh, Ama, did you want to ask your question or did you, you want to unmute it or did you want me to read it? Um, Greetings. I can ask a question. Thank you. Greetings, Wagan. Well, um, hello. You, you better tell them, Amo, who's this Wagon you're talking about? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's you. That's uh, Dr. Finch's um, name from Senegal. And so he's named after, um, he went there and he was given his name after a king way back in history. And his name is Wagon Fai. So the people there in saw him as having the same or similar spirit. So his name is Wagan Fai. So it's his other name. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> my question was that you mentioned that there were 97 pyramids in Kemet. And I wanted to know what is the relationship between, if there is a relationship between the number of pyramids and the Tekken that were there because we know there's only seven left. I think, I don't know how many they took out thousands or something. I, 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 I wish I could answer that. Okay. 
I just, uh, Alma, I just don't have that answer. I'm sorry. Um, okay. I should, you know, maybe I should, but I don't. <laughs> sorry about that. Like I said, like I said, Alma's a good friend of mine, so I hate to disappoint her. Mm -mm, okay. <laughs> Thank you. What doctor, what you, thank you, sis. Are you from, are you okay with us calling you Dr. Finch, or do you want us to refer to you? How would you like to be? Um, uh, Amo, well, Amo, what do you think? But it, but it, it's whatever people are comfortable with. So. Yeah, you can call me. Yeah, you can call me Dr. Finch, or you can call me Wagon Phi. Mm hmm How and how are we spelling Wagon Phi? Wagon is uh, that's a that's a Serer name from the uh, east uh, from uh, Senegal. They gave me that name. The uh, Saltiges, they're the traditional healers of the Serer. And Wagon Wagon Phi was one of their earliest kings from the 14th century. And I had been going back and forth to Senegal, going back and forth, doing projects there. And uh, they they gave me that name. I and I, I I didn't ask for it. They gave it to me. And uh, Wagan is W A G A A N. Phi is F A Y E. So a lot of my you know, friends of mine uh, who know that name call me Wagan. Okay, are you comfortable with us calling sure. you Wagan? Uh, absolutely. Okay, well then, okay, with the Wagan Phi, we have another question. And it's from the chat, and it's Mr. Derek Holt of the African Restoration Project, a leader here, a local leader here. Um, Mr. Holt, would you like to unmute and ask your question, or do you want me to read it? Okay, I'll read it. Uh, while on Phi, it's this uh, honor to um, talk to you. When I first got started in studying uh, African history, you were the second lecture that I listened to live. And um, Kwesi Osafo, he brought you out to Los Angeles, uh, actually in Carson. And, uh, and so I count him as one of my Jagnus who has transitioned. But uh, my question is... Um, wait, 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 wait. I, I, I got to... Uh, I'm sorry, I got to interrupt. The, uh, uh, the, the name Wagon Phi just came up and it's, a mis it's misspelled. Okay, I don't know who's putting that up there. It should be W A G A A N, and Phi is F A Y E. I'm sorry, sir, but I just had to correct that. Okay. Okay. No now worries. continue. Uh, can you give it to me one more time? And I'll hear from uh, typing in for you so they can see. Um, one more time, uh, Doctor Charles. Finn. Sorry, how you spell it? Uh, Wagon is W A. G A A N. Do you see uh, Ngozi, Ngozi Williams at the bottom? She's another friend of mine. She's out there. Okay, Wagon is W A G A A N. That's just that's my that's my first name. Phi is F A Y E. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. I mean, I didn't mean to interrupt. Interrupt. I'm sorry, but I I just couldn't let my name. <laughs> Uh, you know, the misspelling of my name continues. So, okay. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for the correction. Uh, so my, my question is, is, is there any benefit to studying uh, African astrology? Sure. And if so, why? Absolutely. Where do you think it came from? I, I through your lectures, I heard you speak on it many times. Yes. Where, where do you think it came? All, you know, astronomy, all of your, well, your, the ancient people of ancient Kemet used to 365 days out of the year. They, you know, because Egypt, I don't know about how many people have been to Egypt, but it's cloudless all the time. There are almost no clouds anywhere in ancient Egypt. I remember I said there are times when it rains very occasionally, but that's very occasionally, but you can go 365 days and never see a cloud. So the skies are always clear morning, noon, and night. So those people um, studied the heavens every night. So by doing that over a period of, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years, they developed what we think of as astronomy. But they also developed uh, a uh, understanding that there is a 
a relationship, an energy or power that comes from the heavens to people on earth, which uh, uh, later on became called astrology. You know, astrology is, you know, is real. Now, maybe the way they do it in the newspapers and whatever, you know, you don't have to pay attention to it. But it, uh, the heavenly bodies do impact us in ways that most of us have no sense of. So, uh, and I don't try to, I don't try to talk to people about astrology. I'm, I'm not, not try, I'm not interested in convincing people. But um, it's not just, it's not, I don't want to, I don't know if there's a word I'm looking for, but um, it's real. Okay. And, and my last part of that, can you direct uh, us to any books or literature that gives the origin? Because the only thing that, that's out there really is uh, the Greek origin of astrology. Origin. Lord have mercy. You'd think I would know. No, I can't. No, I mean, I'm trying to rack my brain. And no, the answer is no, I cannot at this point. There must be something, but I can't, I can't pull it up in my brain. Um, so it would just be the relief in Dendra? In oh, yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. That's right. Check, look at that. Yeah, look at the, uh, sir, have you been to Kemet? No, I haven't. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. That, that's a good reference. The, the Dendra. And look up Dendra. And um, I'm trying to think what book deals with Dendra. Because Dendra is uh, sacred to Ellen Hathor or Isis? I think it's sacred to Hathor. Head hair. Um, yeah. That's a good, uh, that is, that's good. Dendra. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay, very good. All right. Um, Walking Fi, um, our minister uh, would like to just uh, add um, that Napata Playa is in the Nubian Desert. Yes. There are pyramids in Napata Playa. And um, are you asking if it is older? Oh, that appear, she says, that appear to be older than the Egyptian pyramids. And I guess... I, did, I, 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 I have no knowledge of that. I've never heard that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to say it's not true. I just don't have enough knowledge to, uh, to comment on that. So, uh, I'm, you know, I... Uh, no, no, I would say that... Uh, I, I just, I'm going to say, uh, let me not try to say, talk about something I really don't know enough about. All right, that's not the playa. N-A-P-T-H-A-P-L-A-Y-A. That's right, not the playa. That's it. All right, well, we have a question from my assistant, who is Sin Masinti Sara. Do you have a question for Wagon Fi? Um, thank you for your contributions in this book and thank you for speaking to us tonight. Um, my question for you is, what should the focus of new scholars be? And uh, besides passing down the information, what do you task the new scholars in furthering the information? Study the heavens. I mean, really study the heavens. We don't have enough black people who study the heavens. It's, 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 you say, well, that's just, because for them, for the, for the ancients, there was, no, there was no more important undertaking. And we don't have any, how many black uh, people, black astronomers do you know? I don't know any. Astronomers, not just astrologers, astronomers. Study the heavens in the same way the ancients did. Not just one or two of us, but we we cover all of this and that. That means, you know, a lot of study. Because we got a lot lot of ground to... I remember, let's see, last time I was in Egypt, was the last time of the time before, 
my friend uh, Anthony Karak Browder is a co-director of a uh, excavate you know, a tomb excavating a tomb of Karakamun, and I went to see it. Sure. And uh, I was walking back from the tomb to the to the bus on the road, and I stopped halfway. Uh, stopped halfway between the bus and the tomb, and I said, and I said for no reason at all, I said. There are artifacts down beneath my feet. I said, I think there might be a whole temple beneath my feet. I had that do you say, well, how do you know that? I don't know how I knew it. It's just what came over me. I just felt it. Yeah. Yeah, I did. And that's why that's when I really realized most of Egypt is still underneath the sands. Sure. All right, Mr. Um, did they answer your question? Two. Thank, all right, thank you, all right. Friends. Okay, Walk and Fly, we have a question from another one of our esteemed elders at Caress Unity Center of African Spiritual Science, who happens to be out your way. I believe he's in the Carolinas or thereabout. And he has a question as well. Um, Msanga Mbeli, Andre Parvenu, did you want to unmute and ask your question, or did you want me to read it? Sure, I'll, I'll ask it, and I'll just be brief here. First of all, it's such an honor to be here, Doctor Doctor Finch Wagenfei, and um, it's 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 amazing. I've been following your work a long time, and it's to have you here in person is just just a phenomenal experience. Um, I wanted to save my question to the end because I viewed it as being pretty much your marching orders for us. Uh, what and we are all aware that there's a disturbing persistency of um, European and Ab Arab settler colonialists to attack African Americans and our scholars in the growing awareness of Kemet as being a part of our true history and culture. You know, as we all know, they think that they're trying to, that we're trying to claim their history when it's really the other way around. And Zahi Hawass and the other prominent races have, have, have been a real problem for us. Um, and it's become increasingly a problem because they're actually beginning to threaten our actual presence when we visit these monuments in our tours and in our lectures and so on, when we go to Kemet. Um, so this battle we know has been going on for decades. You know, I re referenced the 1974 UNESCO conference where our scholars really blew them out of the water, that Afrocentric, I uh, know the Arab-centric, European-centric view completely out of the water. And thanks to Brother Enoch and Simpson and, and uh, um, Enya and, and others, we studied that era um, that year quite carefully in our class before this one. But a case in point of what I'm saying on a modern day struggle is the One Africa Conference of last year, February 22, that was actually canceled when the Arabs yeah. heard about it and they actually threatened to sabotage and physically do us harm because it was so too risky to continue because of our attendees, many of our attendees were elders. Um, um, so we, we called it off and, and had that conference in Detroit instead. But this class and your excellent books are excellent examples of how we can mentally prepare out and arm ourselves to do continuous intellectual and ideological battle against these races during our present and upcoming generations. But my question is, what else would you advise us to do to assure that victory is truly ours and that we are triumphant in raising the consciousness of our people and reclaiming our true birthright of ancient Kemet on this planet once and for all, where it's unquestionable? It's what I've okay. already said. Put the time in. Don't try to get it done in your lifetime or even uh, in this century. But you still, you know, it's uh, like you uh, apply yourself, collectively speaking, and you never let you never let up. And you don't let these kind of setbacks where, as you say, there are uh, elements in Egypt who are trying to intimidate black people from even coming to Egypt, let alone uh, telling the truth about it. You just right. you just uh, just assume that this is you're going to be up against this, right. and so don't don't get into a don't get into a snit about it. Saying okay, yeah, this is about what you expect, but uh, so you continue to do what you're doing, not just for the not not just for your, your this this time, place, lifetime, but until you you we have have recovered it all. And you got to put it put in years and decades and centuries. Yeah, I, I've been countering them doing this uh, debunk Afrocentricity movement 
and the Afrocentricity is a hoax movement on the internet. You know, there's a growing movement against, and it, it gets violent. Those chat rooms get very violent and adamant. You know, they're very adamant about their views. But uh, my second, um, and I, I appreciate that, to continue doing what we're doing is sort of shopping our skills to continue to do this, this great work and this battle that we're on. Uh, the second is it's, it's pre-Columbian diffusion. As you know, Dr. Von Sturtenberg mentions the Olmecs, and, yes. and there are other in instances, like in the Grand Canyon and other artifacts that have been found here, terracotta uh, findings, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Eric Von Wotenau's uh, terracotta works, and throughout Central and, and Middle America and South America, there are Egyptian-influenced artifacts. Can you share with me how far-reaching the diffusion, I've seen the boat over there, that huge boat that's encased there by the pyramids. So we know that we have uh, uh, navigational travel beyond um, the European and the African continent. But can you assist us in the time frames of these migrations that occurred uh, during that time period? And, from where, uh, and then from where to where? Whole, uh, pyramid building. From where to where? From Africa, well, no, 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 time it, it, uh, oh. uh, from yeah, the time frame, okay, time frame, uh, approximately 1200 BC or so, 1200 to 800 BC, 1200 BC, and what's it, supposed to what's supposed to have happened in that period, uh, La Venta specifically. Oh, okay, now, um, what, and what, I, yeah, now, I, and what, and what is it you you want me to say about that? Well, what I'm I'm asking for is, can you shed some light on that whole dynamic period where Africans took the whole art and skill of temple building, pyramid building, and influenced other um, <clears throat> civilizations, um, uh, settlements, uh, not just eastwardly out of the uh, cultural heartland of uh, uh, of the Nile Valley, but also west across the Atlantic Ocean. What what um, what would you say, uh, or would you say they were influenced from ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, on the Mayan, on the Aztecs, on the oh, Aztecs, okay. yeah. the Olmecs, the Toltecs, and the well, others? All you have to do is just, if, if, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been to Mexico, just go see those monuments, and then yes. you don't have to yes, wonder. I, I've, I've actually climbed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you see, I got this picture up here. Yes. Uh, African presidents and uh, Olmec. Look at look at those people. I wanted to elaborate on that. That's what I'm asking. Can you see that picture that I'm looking at? So whoever's putting this up, come on. I don't yeah, even you know, I don't even worry about I don't even worry about arguing anymore. I don't. I'm right. not, I don't know. I, 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 I don't. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I, don't, I don't care to argue. I said these monuments and these faces and these sculptures they speak for themselves. So we don't have to. Uh, so you know, I got to the place where I, I'm not. I'm not interested in proving anything to you. I mean, to you, no, no, to, the, right. to the opponents. Right. You know, right. I mean, and, and, I, and I agree because I've traveled to La Venta and I spent time a considerable amount of time in Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and throughout that area. I've been throughout the Yucatan, so I know exactly what you're saying. Uh, but I guess what I'm asking you, with your expertise, uh, could you shed some light on what you think occurred in terms of their actual navigation and travel? Uh, from there, or it's obvious that there was a, a comedic influence. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, I don't think you have to uh, make it complicated. It went there from from West Africa, from from Northern Africa. They went, they went, they went across the Atlantic, and earlier than even we even think. So, um, and like you say, you look at these faces. I don't think I don't think you have to worry about trying to or care about proving it to your uh, opponents. And, and, and I, I don't. I don't. I okay. was actually exploring. Right. And, and um, Sanga, we appreciate you for bringing our class to a close, um, and we appreciate you for engaging um, our guest um, in, in sharing his knowledge. So please, everyone, give a huge round of applause for Wagon Fine and all the knowledge that he brought us. This is a nice lead up to my birthday tomorrow. Oh, oh,
Amazing, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. I say, I say. All right, yes, happy birthday. Yes. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna turn um as we close in these last five minutes for announcements and any class words from um Walk and Fire, we're gonna turn the the, the class over to Ms. Cynthia Sarai and to our minister, Reverend Erica Nima Otbird. I'm Sister Emmy, and, and it's been my pleasure to serve. Do I owe once again, Dr. French? Oh, that was amazing. Okay, announcements, everyone. The Crest Unity Food Thursday community distribution wants to feed everyone. Bring your family and friends to pick up a few things. Just give me one second. Sorry about that. To pick up a few things, food, veggies, bread, salad, sandwiches, fruits. Uh, stop by and commune with your Crest community. We're here every Thursday from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. It's all free. Donations are gratefully accepted. Don't forget, we really need volunteers for our distribution days. Help is needed to unload the delivery trucks, set up tables and tents, bag and box of food, help with distribution, etc. If you're available from 9.30 a.m. to 3 p.m., please contact the Put Some Soot or Reverend Erica Nima Atra. And if you can only stay for one hour, hey, we could still use you. Come and learn and read and understand the sacred language of Meru Nature. A Butsam Sud is teaching an introductory course for beginners. The required books for the course are Reading Egyptian Art by Richard H. Wilkinson and How to Read Egyptian Hieroglyphs, a step-by-step -step guide to teach yourself by Mark Collier and Bill Manley. Both books can be found on the internet at very low prices. Suggested donation for the course is $20 per month. I'll be there and I hope to see you there. Beginner's Medu class begins every Tuesday from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Monday through Friday, we have Sa Heru Simsem Kat M Abu, or morning prayer, meditation, and sacred movements at 6 a.m. with a but some soot. Come, we're learning the, uh, studying the parrot Heru. Um, we're learning through all the Necheru and so forth, places and whatnot. And come, it's, it's, uh, Great way to start your day. Next we have Ma'at, the moral ideal in ancient Egypt by Malana Karenga. Sundays at 9 a.m. to 10, 15 a.m. Facilitated by Sin Saba Diamen and Abut Sim Sut. And also by Sin Saba Diamen, we have Meeting of the Masters. Would you like to speak on that, Diamen? Really quick. Yeah, really quick, yeah. Um... Meeting of the master commences tomorrow with our first session. And uh, so, so far, you've really got until 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time tomorrow to register for the class to get in for that day. And if you're looking to um, get in and you need some special considerations, please reach out to me. Thank you. It, it, it's midnight here, so I'm about ready to, to kind of close shop. So. Um, is there anything else you need to hear from me? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yes, of course. We need to hear from you about your website, your books, and okay. any upcoming events besides your birthday and how people can um, um, maintain contact with you if they like to follow your progress. Uh, through, through the website is the best way. Charles S. Finch at gmail.com. Is that right, Ellen? Charles S. Finch at gmail.com. I'm sorry. It's, it's, uh, what? Charles S. Finch.com. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just charlesfinch.com. Sorry. That's the website, charlesfinch.com. Okay. Now, what there was some, what else were you asking? Anyway, you know, about you said your, 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 your current projects, anything. Oh, current projects. Oh, oh, yeah, the book. book, book, the book you, you see the book right there. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it'll be basically going to be, it's in the process of, oh, Sorry, they're putting uh, a index is being put in it. Uh, we're looking uh, t towards May 1 as the actual publication date. Uh, if you put your money up now and uh, you save, uh, I think it's yes, $35. <laughs> uh, whereas afterwards, after May 1, it'll be $45. Um, but that's um, 
that's coming. That you know, that's uh, my latest major project. Um, uh, Nile Valley Civilization, a ten thousand year history. Um, let me see, what else am I doing? Oh shoot, I'm sure there's something. The, trip, the tour, twenty twenty four. Yeah, yes, yeah, right. Uh, tour to Kemet, uh, July eighteenth through thirtieth, twenty twenty four. And um, just uh, oh, hold on, no sugar. Where is that? Doctor Finch? This is Nick. I want to say sorry for misspelling your name wrong from earlier. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> I forgot all about it. <laughs> oh, hold on, hold on. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's the gift of the Nile tour. The gift of the Nile tour, 11. The 11th one. Um, gift of the Nile tour, under the leadership of Char Charles III, July 18th to 30th, 2024. July 18th to 30th, 2024. Now what it is, from New York, JFK, uh, all-inclusive, there and back, includes everything, $5,399. Now that might make some of you take a deep breath, but, you know, that's I, I don't make these prices. My uh, tour company, the tour company that does this for us, uh, 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 arrives at the price. So that's what that is from New York, JFK, July 18th to 30th, 2024. Um, not only will we see all of these, uh, um, uh, all of these sites that you can, all of these sites, but there will be a nightly lecture. A nightly lecture. I say, I say. Well, before you go, and if you could just hold on and close out with us, um, we have our minister who's in West Africa, Sierra Leone. Um, she didn't speak earlier, and she would like to address you as well as the class and close us out. And that is our minister, our beloved minister, Abut Samset. Good evening, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me. Tipu. Tipu. We can hear you just fine, Abut. I, I, am just this, I, I am amazed that I am getting reception tonight here at, um, in Freetown, but that just shows you how powerful our desire and our thought and the inspiration that Dr. Finch has given us this evening that the ancestors said yes to just our deepest, deepest desire to be home and to also be with you in our other home and just say, do I, do I, thank you so much, Dr. Finch. And thank you for those words about what we needed to do in terms of looking up to the heavens and continuing to study and to align ourselves as above, so below. Um, because that, that's, that's what we've been trying to do through all our spiritual classes at Karas Unity Center of African Spiritual Science. And I also want to say that, that what you've talked about in terms of us just doing the work, in just in two days, I will be on the land that has been given back to me, 10 acres here in Sierra Leone. And to be able to walk that land and say, we, we have, you know, we have been given our father's land back and to just feel the power of just knowing that those 10 acres now belong to our ancestors again is, is an incredible testament to the work that so many have done because it's just not my work, but the work that so many have done so that, you know, we go and celebrate and do a ritual and, and we're going to make many sacrifices um, this next couple of weeks coming. And we have, or I brought drums in from Guinea um, and had them made by craftsmen here. We can drum and dance and just sing the praises of our ancestors for being so powerful and standing so strong. And, and we being able to say we are strong because they continue to be strong. And we want to say ashe to elders such as yourself who have inspired and guided and been steadfast in your your desire for us to know the truth and to live the truth and to stand in ma'at. So again, everyone, just do your part because your part will lead to a greater, greater, greater rising of our people in the future. You you lay your brick down and know that our ancestors have got your back. We will be victorious because this day I feel that victory has been had for all of us as we walk this land here. And there are six of us that are here. So Crass Unity Center, 
I thank you for all of the inspiration that you have given me. I thank you for the love and the grace of our ancestors and for us being the RAS Unity Center of African spiritual science that will inspire the next generation of scholars and seekers of truth. Ashe to all of you and Ashe Dr. Finch because I plan on being on that trip with you next year. I'm going this year for my birthday in July, and I will be there if the ancestors willing with you next year. Ashe. Ashe. Okay, where are we? We say divine love through me. Divine love through me. And love through me. All that I am. All, all that I, I have, have all, all that I give, all that I and give, all and all that I receive, we give freely, and we receive abundantly. I say, do our old Dr. Finch, do our old, do our and do our old Karas Unity Center. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be 